Welcome to the Cisco Netacad CCNA Introduction to Networks video series by Jason Johnson. This video is Chapter 10, the Application Layer. The material in this video covers the 6.0 version of the Cisco Netacad CCNA Introduction to Networks course. I want to thank you for watching my videos. Your time is appreciated. If you find the material helpful, you can subscribe to my channel and remember to click the notification button if you want to see when I post new content. If you have any questions, you can leave a comment below. If you watch to the end of the video, I will have links to the next chapter. So let's take a look at Chapter 10. In Chapter 10, we're going to look at application layer protocols, explain how the functions of the application layer, the session layer, and the presentation layer work together to provide network services, explain how common application layer protocols interact with end-user applications, and we're going to look at well-known application layer protocols and services, you know, web applications, email protocols, IP addressing protocols, how they operate, and explain how file transfer, file transfer protocols operate. So that's, and then we're going to have, a, we'll have a summary at the end. So let's take a look at application layer protocols first. The application layer is closest to the end user. It's at the top of the OSI layer. Uh, it's your, uh, it's the application layer protocols help exchange data between programs running on the source and the destination host. The TCP IP application layer performs the functions of the upper three layers of the OSI model. If you remember back to a previous video that I did when we did a compare of the OSI and the TCP application or the TCP IP, uh, the TCP, the top three layers of the TCP IP are simplified in to the, uh, or I'm sorry, the top layer of the TCP IP performs the same functions of the upper three layers of the OSI model. Common application layer protocols include HTTP, FTP, TFTP, and DNS. The presentation and session layer, they format the data, compress and encrypt the data, and then pass it on down. Common standards for uh, video include QuickTime, Motion Picture Expert Sub Group, or MPEG. Uh, common graphic in, in, uh, image formats such as GIF, JPEG, or PNG are on there. Uh, the session layer creates and maintains dialogues uh, between the source and destination applications. And the session layer handles the exchange of information to initiate dialogues, keep them active, and to restart sessions that are disrupted or idle. Now, the TCP IP application layer protocols, uh, they specify the format and control information necessary for common Internet functions. Uh, they must be implemented in both the source and the destination devices. And the protocols implemented on the source and destination host must be compatible to allow communication. So this is a uh, graphical representation of the application layer. You have name system, DNS, host config, email, tra file transfer, and web web uh, protocols there, HTTPS and HT HTTP and HTTPS. Now, how do application protocols interact with the end user applications? Uh, the client server model, uh, the client requests information while servers provide it. Uh, client and server processes are considered to be in the application layer and the contents of the data exchange will depend on the application in use. And so email is an example of a client-server interaction. So an email client will send, an e send information to the server and send, say, hey, I got your email, and hey, I've got email for you. Now, with peer-to-peer -peer networks, uh, data is accessed without the use of a dedicated server. Uh, two or more computers can be connected to a peer-to-peer -peer network to share resources. Uh, every connected end device, a peer, can function as both server and a client. Think of uh, if you've got two computers set up here, we've got a print client file server here and a print fi server file client over here. We don't actually have a print server, uh, but this printer here says, hey, I've got a printer attached to me, and if you want to print to me, you can. So this peer over here says, hey, I'm sending information for a print file. It has the printer spool. It receives the information and then passes it on to the printer, and you get your paper. Boop, just like that. So the roles of the client and server are set on a per-request basis, so you don't need a server involved in the peer-to-peer. Now, peer-to-peer -peer applications, uh, they can also use a hybrid system where some resources sharing is decentralized. Uh, so you may have a server that has uh, like header file information. Uh, I'm not going to mention any in particular here. If you've done anything on the Internet, you probably know what I'm referring to as far as um, 
um, as far as file sharing and things like that and peer-to-peer -peer applications. So like header file information will be restored on a server and then I, the actual data then will be decentralized out to a whole bunch of different clients. So indexes that point to the resource locations are stored in the central, di central directory so it doesn't take much overhead at all. And in the hybrid system, each peer accesses an index server to get the location of all the stored uh, information. So it may be spread out over you know 500 different uh, clients. And so I'm looking for a particular file and I go to the server and I say, okay, where's the file index? And it says, oh, it's on these 10 different, diff 10 different clients over here. And then my computer then sends requests to those 10 different computers ac asking for all the file pieces to be sent to me. And then it reestablishes it on my end. So that's a peer-to-peer -peer and decentralized um, or what they call the hybrid. Now, common peer-to-peer -peer networks include, you know, we've got eDonker, UG2, BitTorrent. These may be a little bit outdated. This is, a, uh, I'm recording this in September of 2017, so by the time you're watching this, it might be a little bit outdated, but BitTorrent is one that's uh, kind of common or has been common. Uh, many uh, P2P applications allow users to share pieces of many files with uh, each other at the same time. So if you're a hosting, if you're a host peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, you may have partial files on your computer, so you may not, uh, let's say you're, you're, you're sharing a video on your computer or you've got video information you may only have a segment of that or a small piece of that video on your computer or you could be sharing the whole thing but then clients only pull pieces of it from yours so they don't pull the whole thing from you so a small torrent file contains information about the location of all the other users and tracker computers and trackers are computers keeping track of all the files hosted by the users. And for example, if you're hosting a, uh, a you know, let's say a movie on your computer, uh, your information gets sent to those tracker computers. So that's uh, called BitTorrent. Uh, there's lots of them out there. Um, uTorrent, FrostWire. These these may be old by the time you're watching this video, but there's a lot of them out there. I will just say, be careful when you are using BitTorrent and you're torrenting files. Um, especially if you're doing programs and things like that because they are uh, known um, to be um, you know, basically pirating software, pirating music, things like that, and that can get you into trouble because depending upon what country you reside in, uh, you can get in trouble. You, know, you could be breaking a law in your country. So just be careful that if you are doing bit torrenting or if you're doing any type of torrenting uh, that you are observing laws and uh, uh, you know, that, that, that's, that should be a consideration. All right, so well-known application layer protocols and services. What are they? Um, they are things like web and email protocols, so hypertext transfer protocol, hypertext markup language, HTML. A URL is a reference to a web server, so URLs and URIs are the names that most people associate with web addresses. So URLs contain the protocol, the server name, and the requested file name. Using DNS, or dynamic name service, the server name portion of the URL is then translated to the associated IP address before the server can be contacted. So it takes the uh, name. So for example, and I'm going to put a plug in for my website, jasonejohnson.com has an IP address associated with it on the DNS servers. So if you plugged in jasonejohnson.com or cisco.com, uh, it, it would go to a DNS server and that DNS server said, okay, hey, I've got that name. It's Jason or it's uh, Cisco and here, here's the IP address and I'm going to forward you to that. So HTTP and HTTPS, the browser sends a GET request to the server's IP address and asks for the index. Now, it may, not, it may send it to the name, and the DNS server does the translation, so keep that in mind. So, and then, it, and then it, once it gets the IP address, it sends it there. The server sends the requested file to the client. The index.html was specified in the URL and contains the code for the web page and gets loaded. And the browser processes the code, formats the page for the browser uh, based on whether you're getting Java, whether you're getting CSS code, whatever you're pulling in, that's all going to get then to get displayed in your browser. Just remember that HTTP is not secure. Messages can be intercepted. So if somebody's on your network and they're doing wire sniffing and they're watching those packets go through, they can recreate that HTTP traffic. And so whatever web page you're looking at or information you're looking at, they can see it too. HTTPS uses authentication and encryption to secure the data. So you always want to make sure that if you're putting in passwords or if you're putting in sensitive information that you're doing HTTPS. I always recommend um, using HTTPS anywhere as a uh, either Chrome or Firefox uh, browsers. Um, you know, get those because um, that way it forces HTTPS if um, if, it, if it's if it's available. Uh, and the reason you and the reason. Uh, web and you may say to yourself, well, why doesn't everybody just use HTTPS? Well, it takes extra overhead. So HTTPS does require more bandwidth. So web servers and web web 
people hosting don't put HTTPS on everything if they don't have to because then it doesn't take as much bandwidth because, again, you're paying for that bandwidth. If it was up to me, everything would be encrypted on the internet and you wouldn't be able to you know, get anything. But that's again, that's that's not me. I'm not paying for the bandwidth. Now, email protocols. Email is a store and forward method of sending, storing, and retrieving e-messages. Email messages are stored on mail servers. Clients communicate with the mail servers to send and receive, and mail servers communicate with other mail servers to transport messages. So you may send, let's say we have a server here and you're over here. Uh, you'll send your email up here, and then the server sits here, and it says, okay, I need to forward this information to this mail client over here. You don't send it directly to the client. It's not like that. It goes to a server. The server sits there. There may be another server over here, and it says, hey, uh, I need to go to this email client over here, and then that client pulls from its server. If you're on the same server, it's the same email server. But if you're on separate servers, you know, let's say that you're going from, uh, you know, for for example, going from uh, maybe Gmail over to Yahoo, it goes to different uh, servers on there. So email relies on three separate protocols: SMTP, POP, and IMAP. I really recommend doing some reading on those three. Uh, you want to know the differences of those. You want to know the ports for those. Those are ones you need to know the ports. You're gonna get those on exams. SMTP. Uh, Pop and IMAP, you want to go research and look at those ports. Um, you, you need to know about these. Uh, you're you're going you're gonna to get questions on them on your exam. So the SMTP operation, message formats require a, a message header and body. The header must have a properly formatted receipt, a recipient email address, and a sender address. And an SMTP client sends the email by connecting to a server on port 25. And the server receives the message and stores it in a local mailbox and relays the message to another mail server. Users use clients to retrieve the messages stored on that server. Now the POP operation works a little bit different. Messages are downloaded from the server to the client and they do not stay on the server. So email clients direct their POP request to mail servers on port 110. Again, just memorize those. Uh, POP allows for email messages to be downloaded by the client's device and they are removed from the server. So you have to remember that. So if a POP server, if I pull my email down and I go to check it from somewhere else, they're already gone. They get downloaded to each client. So a download message res resides on the device that triggered the download. So that, that's, that's, that's key to remember on, about POP. Now IMAP protocols is another protocol uh, for email. It allows for messages to, messages to be displayed to the user rather than downloaded. So you're actually seeing it on the server. So something maybe like Gmail. That if you're looking at that, you're looking at those online. So the original message resides on the server until it's manually manually deleted by the user. You don't actually download that message to your client. Well, you do if you're well, you do you're looking at those. You can download them, by the way. Just let me say you could download those like a mobile device or your desktop. Uh, but usually, like a browser uh, is going to host that information. It's going to pull it up each time. Each time. So users view copies of the message in their email client software, and support folder hierarchy. Is, is granted to organize and store email. And so when a user decides to delete a message, excuse me, when the user decides to delete a message, the server synchronizes that action and then deletes the message from the server. Now, domain name service or DNS, uh, that is IP addresses are not easy to memorize. So, you know, remembering, you know, if I've got to remember 192.168.10.11 is my website for my for my web page. And then I've got to go over to Google and that's uh, 192.168.5.11. It's trying to remember, like trying to remember phone numbers for people. We, we don't do that anymore. We have phone, we have phone, we used to have phone books. Now we have devices that remember all that information for us. Well, DNS allowed for us to come up with common names. So for example, and I'm going to use mine again, jasonejohnson.com, I can come up with that and then I can tie that to my web page and you only have to remember my name. You only have to remember Cisco, cisco.com, and I can put that in and so you don't need to remember the IP address or I can have multiple IP addresses because then I can have web servers on multiple locations. So domain DNS makes server addresses more user-friendly. Computers still need the actual numeric address or IP address before they can communicate. So the DNS server translates that. So a DNS message format, uh, common records, the A, the NS, the uh, AAAA, and MX. Um, for purposes of this course, you don't need to get into these different kinds here. You just need to know that they do come in different types of records. DNS servers search its own records first if you request it. So you can have DNS servers locally that pull information down so it cuts down on traffic out to the internet. The response is then forwarded to the client. The client then says, okay, here's my IP address. It establishes. Uh, you can use ipconfig slash display DNS cache to look at the cache on uh, Windows. 
and you can clear that cache as well. Uh, so if you're if you're having a problem with an IP address or maybe an IP address change for a DNS and you need and you're having problem with that, you can do an IP config. Uh, I think it's flush DNS if I remember correctly, but you can you can look at that in the reading. It's, it's got that. I'm going to try to say that off the top of my head, and I'm probably probably going to get it wrong. Now DNS hierarchy uh, it uses a hierarchical system. If I can pronounce that right, I apologize if I don't pronounce that in proper English. Hierarchical, that's just, I can't say that word. It's a hierarchy. Uh, the naming structure is broken down into small, manageable zones. So you have .com, .org, .au, .co. You might have .us for the United States. Uh, you know, uh, for uh, for uh, colleges, you'll, you'll have .edu. For businesses, you'll have .biz. So each DNS server is only responsible for managing name to IP mappings for a small portion of the DNS structure. So it's kind of decentralized. Requests for zones not stored in a specific, specific DNS server are forwarded to other servers for translation. And then top-level domains represent the type of a domain or the country of or origin. So like a .com, .org, .us. Uh, the NS lookup, um, you can use NS lookup to place DNS queries. That's on Windows. You can use that, and it's useful for DNS troubleshooting. So if you've troubleshooted your IP address and you're like, man, I still can't get this web page, well, you can do an NS lookup to try to see, okay, let me resolve the IP address uh, to the DNS uh, and, and see what the lookup is on that. So that's another tool to be able to use. DHCP, or D Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, uh, Computers need networking IP information, so if you put that in statically or manually, you don't need DHCP. But if you're using DHCP, let's just say that you turn it on, the client – and I'm just going to do it in a simplified way over here. So the client says, hey, I need an IP address. So it sends out a DHCP discover request on the network. Well, the DHCP server sitting there going, hey, I've got, I've got DHCP for you. I'm going to send an offer to you. So then it's going to request and says, oh, okay, I saw that. Let me send that. And then it's going to send an acknowledgement, and it's going to say, here's your IP address. And you can use that for a certain set of time. And so when you set up your DHCP server, you set that time. And then over time, uh, that DHCP client says, hey, I've, I've got this IP address. Is it okay if I keep using this? And if the DHCP server is still available, it acknowledges and says, hey, yeah, you keep using that. And we're going to go ahead and renew your DHCP. And then DHCP supports both v4 and v6. Or I'm sorry, DHCP supports v4, and DHCP v6 supports IPv6. So v6 has its own DHCP protocol or own service. So the operation, and I just talked about that, you have the discover, the request, and acknowledgement. And then over time, again, if the client cannot contact the DHCP server, over time it will lose its IP address, and it, it'll keep using it um, until you have a conflict, but it's supposed to uh, – Keep you know get its DHCP and hopefully another one comes online. But if it doesn't, if your DHCP server goes down and you've got clients out there requesting over time, you're going to start getting conflicts. So then you have to resolve that. Now FTP or file transfer tr file transfer protocol. Let me see if it takes that file transfer protocol FTP. I've been using FTP FTP for a long time, even way back in you know way back in the days on bulletin board systems we used FTP. It was developed to allow transfer of files over the network. An FTP client is an application that runs on a client computer used to push and pull data to an FTP server. It requires two connections between the client and the server: one connection for commands and replies, and the other connection for the actual file transfer. Now. Again, memorize these ports. You're going to see them on exams. TCP port 21 is the initiation and an establishment of the first connection, and TCP port 20 is for the second connection and for the actual data transfer. So 21 is for the connection. 20 is for the data transfer. That's how I remember it, 2021. And you would think it was backwards, right? You would think, hey, wait a minute. Why come 20 isn't for the initiation? Well, it's just not that way. 21 is for the connection, and 20 is for the uh, – or for the uh, establishing connection and server control, and 20 is for the data transfer. Now, the client can download or pull data from the server or upload and push data to the server. So if you're working with like a web server and you need to up, – you're uploading new uh, files to the web server for your web pages, uh, you're, and you use a client such as FTP, you're going to push your files up or you can delete files off the server so they're not seen anymore. That's, a, that's an example of FTP or how you would use it. Now, SMB, or server message block, is a client file serving – Client server file sharing protocol. Let me say that slowly. Uh, it shares a common format, or all SMB messages share a common format. Uh, Microsoft products now support TCP protocols to directly support SMB resource sharing. Uh, the Mac, Linux, and Unix operating systems have their own implementation of SMB. 
and you'll read more about SMB in your reading for the Cisco Netacad uh, on this, the Netacad course. All right, so that brings Chapter 3 presentation to a close. We have looked at, in Chapter 3, uh, explain the operation of the application layer and providing support to end-user applications, and we took a look at some well-known TCP applications uh, at the – or TCP application layer protocols – and the services that are operated on those. All right, so I hope you have a great day, or I hope that I hope this video was helpful for you. If it is, uh, give my give it a thumbs up below. I appreciate that, and I hope you have a great day.